Hi, I'm Caroline. And I'm Adrian. And this is Scandal Sheets. Sheets, the podcast that explores the scandals and scandalous people of history. I'm your host, Caroline. And I'm your co-host, Adrian. Yay! I've already had two whiskey, so this is not going to go well. <laughs> Canadian Club, you need to sponsor us because... Because. And Trader Joe's, since I got our brie. We're all fancy tonight. Yeah, they have good snacks. Yeah. I would accept a sponsorship from Trader Joe's. Absolutely. I would accept it even more if they would come to my neighborhood, which apparently that's like been a... Th- it was briefly a thing. Yes. And now it's back. Oh, is it? Yeah. Oh. They actually said they were going to go into like the grocery complex that's behind my house. And I was like, that would like make my life if I oh, could right. ride my bike to Trader Joe's. Oh, yeah. that That's a good bike ride. I know, right? Mm-hmm. Totally. Hmm. But anyway, (laughs) I'm sure all of you are tuning in for salacious scandals and architectural history. (laughs) Yeah, those two go together really well. I think they do. Because you don't really have salacious architecture. Well, you know, I've always thought that architecture was rather (laughs) dirty. Columns. Talking about architecture can be real dirty. Yeah, it yeah. is. Mm-hmm. I mean, seriously. It's true. I used to say in college that you can tell a man came up with architecture because of all the verbiage. <laughs> I can agree with that. Thank you. So uh, anyway, you have landed on the second installment of our, not series. Trip to Minnesota. Right. Our trip to Minnesota. Virtual trip to Minnesota. Yes, because we all want to go to Minnesota. I do. You do. Not now. Not <laughs> until like... June, at the earliest. I was Ubering before I came over here, yeah. and I got some people from Minnesota. You did? I did, yeah. Oh, my people. Yeah, and they were Aww. very disappointed that it wasn't warmer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I text with my cousin fairly frequently, and it was um, 32 and cloudy there earlier today. So it's 55 and cloudy and very windy here. But it'll be that all this week, whereas this week for us at the end of the week is going to be, be like in the 70s degrees. so <laughs> at least we're getting what we're used to at the end of march yeah charleston weather is schizophrenic at best that's what she said about minnesota weather but they have very crazy temperature swings like they will have freezing we and then 80 well oh, not okay not quite, okay that yeah that's not extreme quite to that freezing extent. freezing but rain have, to 80 is insane ours is still going to be a, a 30 degree shift so that's that's not minor yeah it's like ireland only oh, i really? still want to live in ireland <laughs> That's the retirement plan. Move to Ireland. Open up a really bomb ass B and B. Oh, that sounds really beautiful. I know, and I want sheep. I would definitely want sheep and a hot shepherd. With the to long, like... but they have different sheep there, right? Oh, and they have the Highland cattle. I love the Highland cattle. Oh, the, the that's like, Scotland. I'm sorry, Scotland. I'd take Scotland too. Okay, Ireland's just slightly cheaper, I think. But I don't know. Maybe not. Not with Brexit. It's actually pretty cheap now, the pound is. I keep up with it because... Because that's your plan. Yeah, that's my plan. (laughs) I want to move to the UK. You're not the only person I know. I know. Everybody wants to move now, I think. But I've wanted to move legit forever, so there. Okay. And I can't understand, like, Tim Mojave, who... You guys should know by now, since he did appear last season. (laughs) He says, why will you live in the country in the UK, but not live in the country in the States? I think it's just really different. Right. It's just better. Yeah. That's interesting. Right. You can live in the country and be like a mile from a village. Right. And it's like country. you have everything you need. Right. But in the US, if you live in the country... You have to drive for miles. You're to very anywhere. marooned here. Right. Huh. I guess I never really thought of that. I know, right? But everyone, you know, you sort of idolize the, the English 
picturesque English landscape. That's because it Which is. Which is kind of what we'll be talking about a little bit. Right. So about on that note. Glen, Glen Sheen's <laughs> English picturesque landscape. Let's get to the second installment of Glen Sheen. We should. Yes. <laughs> we should do that. That's what we're supposed to be talking about. Right. <laughs> okay. So a quick sum up from last week. Glen Sheen is this fabulous 30 room, 38 room, 39 room. 38, I think, is the correct count. Okay, 38 room mansion in Duluth, Minnesota. Indeed, it is a lot unless you have five cats like me. (laughs) And in which case... (laughs) And and seven kids like them. Or six. Six kids in a ward. That's right, so seven, yeah. So uh, it was commissioned by Chester Adgate Congdon, a lawyer, politician, iron ore magnate. I think it's Adgate. Is it Adgate? So I watched this PBS documentary that... Um, I think the local station in Duluth did about Glen Sheen and it was fabulous. And, and they did, I think they said Adgit. Adgit. Yeah. It was yes. a quicker That sounds very British. Yeah. It's so, a, yeah. And he was British technically, uh, sure. heritage wise or whatever. So yeah. Adgit. I like that. So Chester Adgit. Congdon. Congdon. Mm-hmm. Right. All right. So he was largely responsible for funding the Masabi Iron Ore Range, which... I find very interesting because I was just listening to a true crime podcast about uh, a series of murders in that area. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. And around that time, or li- like no, later? it was like in the nineties, I think. Oh no! Wait a minute. Sixties. Yeah, but twentieth century and after yeah. this. Okay, right. So, confession: I am a total true crime geek. If you open up my phone and look at my podcast list, they all have to do with. Murder. There's so many good ones, though. They are. Um, Tim is very concerned about my fascination with true crime. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, um, yeah. Chester Adgit Congdon commissioned Glen Sheen, and it was finished in 1909. Right? Mm-hmm. It took over three years to build, um, and it's 27,000 square feet. Glen Sheen, when it was uh, completed, cost... $854,000, which is $22 million today. That's a lot of money. The architect was Clarence Johnston, who was a Minnesota native, and he he created this beautiful uh, Jacobean revival design. And some some people actually consider Glen Sheen to be Jacobethan, which is a, a hybrid of Elizabethan and Jacobean architecture. So this was a, a style that was a trend at the time that Glen Sheen was built in the early 1900s. And it also reflected Ch- Clara and Chester's English heritage, which was um, very near and dear to their hearts. Although they didn't really like the British people. <laughs> yeah, right. So, right. That's what you said last time. I think that Chester was not a huge fan of, of the British he thought they were lazy because I they do, didn't go to work until I do, 8 a.m. I do remember that because I thought, what kind of work ethic do you have to possess that you think that 8 o'clock is, 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 late. is early? I mean, is late. Because I'm totally screwed if that's what it's gauged right? upon. <laughs> so, and I guess just to round out the architecture part, it had a lot of ad- advancements for the time that it was built. It was framed with steel instead of wood. And there was a very conscious effort to make it fire resistant. On the, on the inside, all of the finishes and furnishings were just extremely fine. And the, um, the Congdons were able to spare no expense in the light fixtures, which were silver and gold leaf ceilings and all these exotic woods and stones for the trim and casework and built-ins and mantles so it, it's just a it's just a really exquisite house on the inside I guess I mentioned last time I've been twice and I've just it kind of just gets better like I really want to go again because it's so intact because the same family had it for so long and so they have all the furnishings and they had photographs of the room so everything's really arranged how it was when the Cognans lived there which is just very meaningful I know Chester didn't live there Long, but um, obviously Clara lived there until her death, and so she really got to enjoy the house. The children were able to enjoy the house, and it's really just a masterpiece in Minnesota residential design. And it's one of the most, um, or the most visited um, house museums, I think, in the state. So yeah, uh, Chester and his family 
which consisted of his wife, Clara, six children, plus Clara's nephew, Alfred, all moved into the house by 1910, actually the 1910 census. And I'm a total geek about censuses. I love looking at them because if you know how to read them, they tell you so much about a household. That's cool. And so I looked it up and... Hmm. All the children were listed as living in the house, even though they were adults. Their ages ranged from 27 to 11. But then, again, if you have that kind of room, all your grown children can live with you, and it's right. probably not that big of a deal. Yeah, if I you're... don't think they would have had to cross paths that much in right. a large place. And I did notice that a lot of their children didn't marry until oh. later on, so oh. that that was really Just interesting. Just like their parents. Right. Hmm. So, I did find out that uh, some of the Congdon children were at school when they moved into the house. The second oldest, Edward, or Ned, as he was called, was actually finishing up at Yale. Okay. And then the middle daughter, Helen, was at Vassar, where she would graduate in 1911. And then the youngest daughter, Elizabeth, who will play into the story here in a little bit, was at boarding school in Massachusetts. So, so when Chester died in 1916... According to the newspapers at the time, he was worth six point five million dollars in, in their, their money. money. <laughs> right, wow. that's roughly two billion dollars in today's no money. Way. Yeah, oh my gosh, and he came from nothing. Right, it's really so incredible. We know from reports that a lot of this money was represented by real estate. Mm. Glen Sheen, for example, was valued at two hundred thousand, which is sure. roughly three million okay. in today's money. But that's, it's not just the house, it's it's a really substantial the whole estate. Pro- right, the whole property. The Congdon's asked to make Glen Sheen self-sufficient. So the, the landscape architect, uh, Charles Levitt, created on this estate a vegetable garden, greenhouses, an orchard, there was a cow barn, and a reservoir that actually fed the house. So at the same time that the construction on the house was underway, there were other structures being built on the property, including a gardener's cottage, carriage house, a stone boat house, and a concrete pier. So it was just this whole, like you were saying, it was an estate. It was the main house, but thought was given to every part of this property. Um, The landscape, the important elements of the landscape that made it self-sufficient, and the outbuildings on the property as well. So the style that uh, Charles Levitt designed for the majority of the property, and I'll explain in just a minute why this style doesn't apply to the whole property, is known as picturesque. And this was a a mid-18th century landscape design theory. So the idea is that although it's been altered, the surroundings are going to maintain a natural appearance. So you're looking at something that's been tweaked, but you don't, you can't tell. It's not these like manicured lawns and hedges and things like that. So the the locations and the layout of the plantings and hardscaping is planned and the views are intentional, but they're not forced. The aesthetic is is the opposite then of the highly manicured and symmetrical geometry of what you might see at a palace or a formal country estate. So given Glen Sheen's siding on Lake Superior, formality in the surroundings would have been very impractical and competed with the forest and the natural streams and the rocky shoreline out at Lake Superior. So coming back to me saying it's the picturesque isn't the whole place, it's, it's being applied to most of the site behind the house. There's a terrace with a stair leading to a small, formal, symmetrical garden, and this is this provides a transition between the formal house and the natural surroundings. So this part is, is not, is not picturesque. Um, cause it's like this hardscaped path and it's symmetrical and there's a fountain and everything's very manicured and intentional. It's kind of like, uh, we mentioned last week or we referenced the Biltmore estate in Asheville. Mm-hmm. If you've ever been there, you'll right. know that, you know, it's kind of manicured around... Around the house. Right. Mm-hmm. But then... Olmsted kind of... Did this whole naturalist mm-hmm. thing right. on the outside. Of course, most of their property is the Pisgah Forest now. Exactly. exactly. Or was given yeah. to create the Pisgah Forest. Yeah. So that gives you an idea of how far so, people went. But Olmsted there also is still... He's still planting trees. 